invite you to turn in the Word of God this morning to Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Chapter 8, don't... I mistyped in sending the uh, details of today's bulletin and put in chapter 5, but it's chapter 8. We're continuing on in our look at the Song of Solomon. So those of you that have been here long enough know that we've spent over three years most of our communion services uh, gleaning from the Song of Solomon. And we've worked our way to this point where we are now in the final chapter of the book. I haven't tried to drag it out. That hasn't been my intention. And I've sought to take larger portions when able. But today it's just one text. And so we are... Well, we'll take, no, we'll just just read the fifth verse. Just focus on the text. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I raised thee up under the apple tree. There thy mother brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bare thee. Amen. The Lord bless His Word. May He meet with us today around it as we give consideration to it. Let's pray. God, help us to see what we must see, to learn what we must learn, to know what we must know, that we may be what we must be and do what we must do. Come by Thy Spirit and aid us. We all need divine help. So fall upon the congregation and infill the preacher. Their burdens, their cares, their sins, problems, I know nothing about. So Lord Jesus, come by thy Spirit, shepherd the flock, console, comfort, convict, do thy blessed work. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I sometimes wonder how you're feeling, beloved. I stand up here and I realize from time to time that there are things going on in your life that I know nothing about. Problems that arise, fears that exist, concerns, whether real concerns or imagined that you feel. They may be real, or they may not, but when they exist in your heart, they're as real as perhaps anything. So we come in every Lord's Day. Every time we come in, some of us are on the mountaintop, some of us are in the valley, and some of us don't know where we are. And yet we come here to meet with the Lord Our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, who loves us consistently to the same degree every single day. His love doesn't waver whether we feel on the mountaintop or we experience a sense of being in the valley. His love is the same. He wants to comfort. He wants to challenge. He wants to convict where appropriate in each of our lives. He's in the business of helping us, ministering to us, shepherding us, leading us, guiding us, instructing us, teaching us. He's here with us. Today is another occasion of communion, blessing of sitting and remembering what He has done. And every part of our service pretty much has had a central focus on that as we desire and endeavor and intentionally do. And I have been coming to this book time after time when we sit at the Lord's table because of, again, its centrality in the business of explaining the relationship that exists between Christ and His people. We ought never to get bored of this. It ought never to become something routine. That we can come in today as sinners and recognize, believe, and rest in all that Jesus Christ has done for us, 
all that the Son of God has accomplished, that we can ponder the thought that in His condescension, all that He did was with us in view. Let me say it personally. All that He did was with you in view. Cannot be something that we take lightly or think little of. We should be amazed. Amazed. Amazed that He loves us. So we come today to this text. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5. And I want to look at it with you before we sit at the Lord's table. There are two main headings that we'll see here, God willing. First, we will see something of the outsiders, and then we'll see something of Christ. But the title I've given to this message is, The Church, A Wonder to Behold. The Church, A Wonder to Behold. It may not seem that way, so we, we count ourselves there. We're, we're very ordinary, nothing extravagant. You know, we gather here and the world passes by. Thousands of cars pass by on Haywood Road while we're sitting here. And, and they don't think anything about it. We're not really a wonder to behold as far as they are concerned. But if they were to take a closer look, then they would see that there is certainly some questions that ought to be asked. And so, look up this text with me and see, first of all, she is a matter of inquiry to outsiders. The church is a matter of inquiry to outsiders. Verse 5, who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? Most agree that this language is coming from the daughters of Jerusalem, referred to in verse 4. This group that gets multiple references through the book where they are pondering, they are considering, they are looking upon, they seem to have these various exchanges that rise up. And, and largely speaking, I mean, there's no consensus on who they really reflect. Sometimes it seems like they're completely unconverted, that they know nothing about what it is to be the Lord's. At other times, they have some kind of awareness of things that indicates a measure of spirituality, but they might be reflected upon as those that are distant from the Lord, cold from the Lord. They, are, they know something, but they don't really know. They're aware of certain things, but they haven't experienced what the bride has experienced. Whatever the case, they are here again, and they are observing this particular scene. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? And you see, first of all, that they notice the people. Who is this? Who is this? Leaning upon her beloved. They notice two characters. They see the bridegroom, the beloved, and the bride who is leaning upon him. They notice these characters and they are drawn to consider and ask the question particularly not about the beloved but about her. Who is this leaning upon her beloved? Who's this one? Who is she? What do we know about her? They see in looking at her, no doubt, the fact that she is not one with inherent strength in herself. She, she is leaning upon her beloved, indicating her dependence, indicating her vulnerability. And they see that, they're inquiring, they're looking at her amidst this condition. They not only notice the people, they notice the place, because they are coming up from the wilderness. They're coming from the wilderness. They're coming from that barren place where there's no, no prophet a place that is harsh and difficult, a place where no one really wants to be. And beloved, this scene, this scene here is, is very much just looking at the Lord with His people coming out of the place where He found them. Again, you read Matthew Henry here, that's, that's the scene that he depicts, he observes here. Here's the Jewish church being brought out of the wilderness by the Lord as their Redeemer, pulled out of that condition that they could never deliver themselves from. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, you may turn there just for your own encouragement, but Deuteronomy 32, Moses, in verse 9 and 10, we're told, For the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob is the lot of His inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. 
This is where the Lord found his people in a wilderness. He didn't look at the greatest of people. He didn't look at the, the chief and uppermost and most, uh, that which would be the natural fall of the eye, let's say. When the Lord looked upon the earth and he chose a people to himself, he found a people that had, had nothing. They weren't selling themselves. They weren't showing themselves to be worthy of his attention. That's the way we are. We, that's the way we choose things. It's, it's not like you're going to buy a house and you find like, you know, the, the worst place that is going to give you the most heartache and say, that's the place where I want to pour in my love. I mean, there may be a few that do that, providing the price is right. <laughs> but, but, but you don't do that generally. You don't, you don't look at things. You look at, you look at that which is appealing, that which naturally the eye falls upon and says, yep, that's, that's, that's where I want to abide. But the Lord looks upon a people not like that. He sees the mess that they are, the emptiness, the powerlessness, the lack of glory. He found him in a desert land. And this is the scene then. This is the scene. Israel's being reminded in this book. Again, it's not, it's not marriage. It's not a human relationship. It's the song of songs. If it was a mere human thing, it wouldn't be the song of songs. Any of the Psalms would be far greater than it. It is a song of songs because it elevates the relationship of Christ to his people. And Israel is being reminded that they were found in the wilderness. They were found in the wilderness. They were brought out of that wilderness by the Lord. We might say, first, if the wilderness is the world, there's no coming out of there without Christ and salvation. If the wilderness is the world, there's no coming out of there without Christ and salvation. You can't get yourself out of the world. You're knitted into it. You're bedded into it. You don't know your way through the wilderness without Christ. You can't find a place of refuge by yourself. You might imagine, or there may be those mirages that appear and they're sold to you as, as the very thing that you need. False religions, the aspiration for the American dream, the other aspects that are sold to you as, as conveniences and blessings and privileges. But, but, you, but you try the broken cisterns. And the waters feel every time. But the Lord, the Lord, you see, is the one that can deliver us out of the wilderness, the wilderness of sin. All the hurt and the pain caused by sin, the bruises and the wounds and the scars that mar us, and everything that comes, all the, all the counsel of the world, all the religions of the world, all the philosophy of the world, they fail to deal with the root of the problem. They put band-aids over open wounds that never heal. And we're taught to try and think differently about them, to imagine that we've dealt with the problem, but it's not. It's there, festering, getting infected. Over the years, it becomes worse and worse. So the man lying on his deathbed has no peace, no rest. He has wandered through the wilderness, trying different things, and has never found peace. Because without Christ, friends, without Christ, you can't get out of the wilderness. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? It is one that has been brought by him out of the wilderness, led by him out of the wilderness. Turn to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Here the Lord encourages thanksgiving and praise from men, but you can see the particular individuals that ought to praise the Lord, the opening verses, Psalm 107 verse 1, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands, from the east, and from the west, from the north, and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, 
and he delivered them out of their distresses, and he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Is that not your testimony, Christian? Are you not being called to praise the Lord because this has been the very thing you've gone through? That He found you wandering. All the people, all the people of the nations. It doesn't matter. Here, this is, this is Israel. These are the people in Israel. They're, they're saying this. They're being called to use this in worship. Singing the Psalms to their God. But they identify the fact that all nations are in this, this need of deliverance. That it's not a problem unique to them, that the problem is something that is global, it is worldwide. Men live without direction, without hope, without salvation. They wander in the wilderness. They find no city. They're looking for it. They're looking for it. They are earnestly looking for a place of rest, but they can't find it. It doesn't exist to them. They need lead. This is where the shepherd comes in. This is what we're being told in Song of Solomon. She is coming up out of the wilderness or from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved. She's, she's resting there. And he is leading the way. He is bringing her out of the world in salvation, in deliverance, bringing her to a place, a city of habitation. Now, you're still leaning on him, aren't you, Christian? Tell me you're still following the shepherd. You're still leaning on him and depending on him. Don't tell me, don't tell me that your salvation was some once and done act in the past in the sense that you look to him, you prayed a prayer, and you just kind of have continued on never thinking about him or his will or how you might glorify him. Please tell me that's not your testimony. Tell me today that from that hour that you looked and you experienced eternal life, that you've continued to rest in him to depend on Him, to trust Him, and learning more and more that He can be trusted. But also, if the wilderness is the world, there's no coming out of there without Christ and sanctification. The fact is, we're still in this world. And there's a sense in which we're still in the wilderness. We're not lost. We've been saved. We belong to the Lord and we're leaning on our beloved. We have Christ right there. But He didn't save us and then immediately take us to our final place of habitation. He didn't whisk us into heaven, did He? You're here. You're still in this world. And it has a wilderness feel about it, doesn't it? And some of you know it more than others. Some of you are keenly aware of it. You feel the howling winds. You feel the heat. You feel the difficulty of traversing through this world. Uh, there, there are certain things, certain seasons, certain experiences of life that can shelter us, you know, if we don't have any financial problems, if we have no real desires of, of any particular pressing sort. Then we may drift along and kind of imagine that we're, we're at peace in this world, but very few of the Lord's people feel that. I mean, the Lord's people, when they're really walking close to the Lord, they have this constant awareness that this vile world is no friend of grace to help them on to God. They know that. And so we're challenged by its presence, by its influences, by, by its filth and dirt. And we have to come and sit before the Lord, lean on Him as it were, and have Him, John 13, we have to have Him wash our feet. Wash my feet, Lord. What have you faced this past week? Have you faced sin? Have you seen and heard things that have grieved your soul? In the home? Outside the home? <laughs> you go out there, you face a hostile world. And you need to lean. You need to lean on Him in sanctification as He walks you through the wilderness of this life. So you can see from the text, going back to Song of Solomon, that they notice the people, the bride and the, the bridegroom. They, they recognize who is this 
leaning upon her beloved. They notice the place coming up from the wilderness. But they notice also the posture, don't they? They notice the posture, leaning upon her beloved. Leaning. This is a picture of that oft-quoted, oft-used text. We write it in cards all the time. We tell it to young people. We, we preach it to ourselves in times of difficulty. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. We use it all of the time. All of the time. You come to a juncture in your life and everybody knows you're coming to that juncture. Say you're getting married or something else is happening. You, you know, the, the cards come in and the, the, note the number of them. Note the number of references. Take, take, a, take a look to see. We'll look at all the references people have used and see which ones come up more than any others. I'll tell you that there's a good chance that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 will be one of the most commonly used texts as you come to various points in your life. And there's good reason. But the problem with that, of course, is that we become numb to it. We, we kind of forget or don't think upon what it's saying, but it is advising this very scene. Don't lean upon your own understanding. Don't lean upon self. And all thy ways acknowledge Him. Acknowledge Him. That's where you're walking through life beside the Lord, with the Lord, and you acknowledge Him by leaning on Him. You're not walking side by side as if he's not really there. You're walking side by side, conscious of his presence and leaning on him, placing your weight and your trust right there. Is this not what we are called to do for the entire experience of the Christian life? Lean on Christ. And is this not what he really forces his people to do? Remember the scene in Luke 15? Remember how the Pharisees come and deride the Lord, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. As I always say, I, I, I love it, I love it, because you know, they're deriding him, and he said, look, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you just how much I receive sinners, because you've no idea. You think I'm just spending time with them. I'm here in the presence of them, and you think that's, that's how much interest I have in them. You have no idea. And so he paints the scene. You remember it. The man with a hundred sheep. He has only ninety and nine. He re realizes one that's lost. And he goes out after it. He goes into the wilderness. Goes to the place where wherever the sheep has gone, wherever it has meandered and wandered. And he, he looks and he roams upon the, the places where he, he doesn't want to be, as it were, himself, but he is there for their benefit. And when he finds that sheep, he places it on his shoulders, rejoicing. What's the sheep doing? Leaning with all of its being. Entirely. That's salvation. That's salvation. It's not... Christ does most of it and you do a little bit. You make sure you go to Mass, make sure you're baptized, make sure you go to the confessional, or make sure whatever your form of religion requires of you. No, the shepherd finds a sheep that's lost, he picks it up, and he puts it on his shoulders. All the weight is on him. And he walks with it and he takes it home on his shoulders. The entire way, seeking for a city of habitation, he takes that sheep home. Leaning on him. So this is what we are to do. This is a wonderful picture, isn't it? Leaning upon our beloved. Not leaning on ourself. Christian, don't be leaning on yourself this morning. Stop leaning on your own understanding. Stop leaning on your own wits. Stop leaning on your own strength. Stop leaning on the fact that historically you've done okay and you think because historically you've done okay you have a track record and therefore you can kind of branch out on your own. You can't. Lean on Him. Lean. Lean. Constantly lean. And when you think you're leaning but you're wondering, am I really leaning, then just, just, just lean all the more. 
Don't lean less, lean more. He found you needing, needing rescue. And he had no objection to take all the weight. He didn't say to you, I'll take you home, I'll lead you home if you can walk the way there. He picked you up. So we might say we lean on him for his work, don't we? We lean on him for his work, not our own. What are we celebrating this morning? What are we rejoicing in? What's put before us? Our work? No, his work. This is what we're leaning upon. We lean on the blood of Christ for our pardon, don't we? Oh, that's where we lean. I need pardon. Lord Jesus, I need pardon. Blessed Lamb of God, for He has shed His blood on Calvary's cross. He has died the just for the unjust to bring us to God. That blood speaks for me, speaks, speaks pardon, redemption, reconciliation, union. It calls me into fellowship with the Most High God. And it can't be ignored. It cannot be ignored. The person resting in the blood of Christ cannot be ignored. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Couldn't ignore it then, could he? He couldn't ignore it there, Exodus 12. He could not ignore the blood that was sprinkled upon the doorpost and the lentil of the homes. He couldn't ignore it. So judgment passed over. So we lean on Him. We lean on the blood of Christ for pardon. Stop trying. Stop trying to obtain pardon by your own effort. Maybe if I do this, then the Lord will, will in some way that will deal with my sins of the past. It's, it's like some kind of penance. Now by doing X, Y, and Z, it will cover a, B, and C that I am be guilty of. No. You lean on the blood of Christ for your pardon. You lean on the righteousness of Christ for your justification. How are you going to stand before God? You say, well, the blood of Christ has washed away my sin. Yes. But He looks for righteousness. Not just the absence of sin. The presence of righteousness. The absence of sin does not declare you have obeyed His law. It just declares that you haven't broken it. It is the presence of righteousness that He looks down upon and says, Yes, I am well pleased. And that He saw in Jesus Christ. That He saw there as He was baptized and He said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And that's where you need to be. You need to be right there in Christ, resting in His righteousness, depending on His life. Oh, stop looking, stop looking at yourself. Stop, stop trying to, to impress God. <laughs> really? You know, Christians do that. They do. They fall into a habit of trying to impress God. I know you do because, because I know when I've done it as well. And I know when I do it, when I catch myself doing it. And I imagine for some little thought comes into my head that maybe he won't hear me pray today because of what I have done in some way. Now, there's an element of truth in that. There's an element of truth in the sense that if there's unconfessed sin, the Lord will not hear us. But this is the beauty of the gospel. Sin doesn't have to go on unconfessed. We can repent and be reconciled. And, but it's not based on us. We're not trying to, well, well, I did this, so let me replace it with some kind of good work, like the balances are weighed out before us. No, we lean on the righteousness of Christ for our justification. That's what makes us accepted before the Father. We lean on the Word of Christ for our sanctification. Oh, we do. Isn't that not what we need? Well, what, what do we need to sanctify us, purify us, wash us? It's spoken there in Ephesians 5 concerning husbands, the washing of water by the Word. The sanctifying influence of Scripture. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? What is it that changes our lives? It is his word. What is it that conforms us to Christ and changes us from glory into glory as by the Spirit of God? It is abiding in the word. So Christian, what do we lean into? We don't lean into our own word, our own promises, our own resolutions. 
Ah, that's what you're tempted to do, isn't it? I lean into my own resolutions to sanctify me. <laughs> and then you realize quickly that's not going to do it. It's not going to do it. It won't work. And if it does work, only feeds your pride, which gives you another problem to worry about. We lean on the Word of Christ for our sanctification. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness leaning upon her beloved? Oh, what a sight to behold is this people leaning upon their beloved. And we lean on the Spirit of Christ in our adoption. How do you know you're a child of God? Do you have papers for that? Do you? Some legal thing that you can Show me and say, look, I'm a child of God. Anyone could say that. What is it that makes it real for you? What makes the difference? It is the Spirit of Christ. He comes in. He comes in and he testifies. He bears witness to it. You read Romans 8, you'll see this. He bears witness to it that you're a child of God. You're his. You belong to him. And so when people come and they say, how can I have assurance? I, I can't actually kind of bring them into a position of assurance where I can open the word and I can show them the word of God and ask them what they're trusting in and go through a process. But, but there has to be, there has to be with this leaning on the word, there has to be also this witness of the Spirit. If you're here this morning and you're lacking assurance, that's what you need more than anything. Invite the Spirit of God to bear witness to you that you're His child. And if you're not a child of God, invite Him to convict you and show you that you're lost so that you might know. And we lean on the love of Christ in our perseverance, don't we? We lean on the love of Christ for perseverance. Again, Romans 8, you go there. What, what is it? It's the love of Christ that he lifts up so that we're sure that nothing separates us from him. So if nothing separates me from him, I am encouraged to do what? To continue on. If there is some hint in Scripture that says, well, if I do this, he'll cut me off. And then I convince myself that I have done that. Then I'll not persevere. He's cut me off, what's the point? But when I understand that nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, when I recognize that no matter what, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. When I know that, I persevere. It prompts me to persevere. We lean on him for his work. And we might also say we lean on him in our work. We lean on him for his work, but we also lean on him in our work. We have a work. It's not like we're doing nothing. We have a work in prayer, and we are to lean on him in prayer, aren't we? Lean on him in prayer. You don't come leaning on yourself. Now, I've been really good today, Lord. Look at me. How well. Look what I've done. Here's a list of the great things I've done today. Talk to someone, and, you know, uh, whatever. Oh, the stuff he tried. You don't, you don't do that, do you? Of course you don't. You lean on him. Oh, may our prayers ever. You know, that's a sad thing about many evangelical churches today. And I, and I, I really grieve. I, I grieve over it. I grieve because the people are being left short of something. And I think of how I was taught to pray from the pulpit and from those in the prayer meeting that I where I was first converted, they always would, would begin in some way thinking upon, resting upon, rehearsing before God their acceptance before God. They didn't just come in with requests. They remembered. They remembered their approach. And they're always referring then in their opening parts of their prayers. They're reflecting upon, we come by Jesus Christ. We, they remember they have an advocate with the Father. They, they, they rehearse the cross work, the efficacy of the shed blood the perfection of his righteousness, even as they come and approach on to God. I hope you pick up on that in the prayers offered here because it's instructive. 
What are you doing when you do that? You're, you're teaching your heart. You're teaching everyone around you. You're teaching your children when it's in the home. You're teaching them, lean on Christ in prayer. You're coming up out of the wilderness. You're leaning upon Him even in the work of prayer. You lean on Him in worship, don't you? Can you worship in an acceptable way? Can you? Is your the meditation that you offer to God acceptable simply because of you're doing it or the way you're doing it? You have to lean on Christ, don't you? You lean on Him. Oh, you see, there's a, there's a sense in which there, there are places for prayer in our worship where we, we actually engage in prayer, but all of our worship is a form of prayer. It has to be prayerful, even as you're listening to the Word. As you're listening, learn to pray through the Word. Pray the truths into your heart. Pray them into your soul. Pray them in. Pray them in. It's not passive. It's active. Praying in the Word as it comes to your heart. Not sitting there in judgment over it, but receiving it. Praying over it. Praying through it as it comes to your soul. I well remember this wasn't the case for all my classes in seminary. But <laughs> there, was, there was one in particular, one class in particular, and it was Reverend John Greer's exegesis class. It was the last class of every week. I'll tell you, you talk about ending on a high note. That was it. Every single week, every single week, Thursday afternoon, Reverend Greer would come in and he would go through the Scriptures. And it wasn't like an ex, the exegesis class, which is expounding the Scriptures, explaining the Scriptures, giving the true sense of the Scripture, and so on. It wasn't like he was teaching us rules. He taught us by, here's, I'm doing it. Understand what I'm doing here. It was learning by following what he, how he handled the Scripture. And so for two of the years, I think it was through the book of Acts, or at least one year, and then two years through Hebrews and I remember, <laughs> especially in Hebrews, I remember writing, like, and he made you write every word. Like, <laughs> he dictated it, and he made you write every single word. And if your hand stopped moving, he would chasten you. He'd <laughs> say, so, why are you not writing? But we would be writing everything down, and I would be writing this, my hand getting cramped up after like an hour and a half of taking notes. But I'd be praying, Lord, Help me to see Christ like this man sees Christ in the Word. I was praying through the truth. Help me, Lord. Not just passively recording the words, but praying over, praying over the way this man taught the Scripture. That's how we all should worship the Lord, leaning on Him. We lean on Him in giving. Sometimes we feel it more than others. Things are tight. What do we have to do? We have to lean on Him. We lean on Him in serving. We go about our business. Let it not be that in this body we serve purely leaning on our own strength. May this be a people that lean on Christ. And may the love of Christ so fill your heart as you serve that you you do it as Paul exhorted the servants and the slaves of his day. It's done as unto the Lord. It's not done unto man because that will burn out very quickly. When you don't get the recognition your carnal heart desires, you'll burn out. But when you're doing it with an eye to the Lord, you'll know that your labor is not in being in the Lord. And we lean on Him when witnessing. When we talk to people, when we confront them with the gospel, we lean on Him. Don't, don't, don't lean on your apologetics. Don't lean on the memorized arguments. Lean on Him. As you're talking to people, as that door opens to you and you feel like the Lord is compelling me to talk to this soul, you lean in on Him. As you walk through this wilderness and every so often someone comes up by you and gives you an opportunity to talk, lean on Christ. This is the need, beloved. And this is what they observe. Who is this? that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved. 
Oh, seeing that rest. So, she is a matter of inquiry to outsiders. The church, the church, a matter of inquiry. And the second point, we only have the two main points. She is a matter of interest to Christ. She is a matter of interest to Christ. I raised thee up under the apple tree. There thy mother brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bare thee. Note here, first, his interest leads him to an exclusive work. I raised thee up under the apple tree. I did it. This is the beloved speaking here, as most agree. I raised thee up under the apple tree. So the beloved comes and interjects and says, I did this. I raised thee up. Christ here speaks of his particular exclusive work in raising people up and putting them under the apple tree. I raised thee up under the apple tree. Go back to chapter 2, verse 3. We've already had reference to this. Chapter 2, verse 3. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. He is, the beloved is as the apple tree. So what's it saying here? I raise thee up under the apple tree. I raise thee up under myself. I raise thee up to me. This is, this is showing that sinners are brought to Christ. They are brought to be in proximity <clears throat> to Him. I raise thee up under the apple tree. And why, why are we under the apple tree? Why be under the apple tree? Because the apple tree produces fruit. And what are you to be enjoying as a Christian? The fruit of, of your own works? The fruit of your own labors? The fruit of what the world has to offer? No, the fruit of what Christ offers to you. That's what we're doing this morning. You come and you take, you take this cup. You take the bread. And you're taking the fruit of his work, the fruit of his doing. And you're just taking from it and you're enjoying it. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you will enjoy it. You take of his work, child of God. He raised you up under the apple tree, under himself. You don't get to be raised up away from him. You're raised up near to him, taking from him all that you need. And as I said, if my memory recalls way back in that last time, in chapter 2, verse 3, he does use means to help you. He does, because you know, like a little infant there, little child, little toddler, can't quite reach the fruit. And you wouldn't want it to be left there without it. So the Lord gives teachers and preachers, and they come and they, they take the fruit and they give it down to the young, to the immature. That's what you Sunday school teachers are involved in. That's what you have to do every week when you prepare. You have to be taken from the apple tree, from Christ, and then putting fruit before the children that they don't get fully themselves, but you're helping them to understand. And you fathers, mothers, you're doing the same in the home. And me as a preacher, that's my responsibility as well, but the people benefit from the apple tree. It's been an awful thing that you come to Christ, then all we talk about is kind of the self-help garbage that's lining the shelves of most Christian bookstores today. The self-help stuff, it never really, it makes a passing reference to the work of Christ, but that's about it. That's about it. As if the fact that you're saved is all you need to know about Jesus Christ. Yes, like we said last time, last week, when we talked about angels desiring to look into thousands of years and there's still an interest in the gospel. And some of these preachers, evangelical preachers today, it's like, get you saved and then we can go on to all the practical stuff. And just leave the gospel aside. Really? You haven't begun to taste of the apple tree, if that's what you think. Now, when you really tasted the apple tree, you're always going back for more. You're always, yes. Oh, bless him for his mediatorial work, prophet, priest, and king to my soul bringing me near to God, pardoning all my sins, receiving me, and presenting me faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Oh, so many things. It's an exclusive work that Christ is involved with. I raise thee up. So His interest leads Him to an exclusive work. His interest leads Him to an extraordinary work. I raised thee up. I raised thee. That is, I awakened thee. Or I arouse thee, I brought you to life. This is spiritual resurrection. Spiritual resurrection. 
What did it take? What power did it take to bring you to life? Do you know? Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So he prays, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in this. You see, see Paul, when he's praying for the church, he's not praying simply that they might have their material ends met or that their pains might go away. The greatest need they have is more understanding. This is a saved people. Ah, not just a saved people, but a people that had the Apostle Paul minister to them for a long time. Three years he was in Ephesus. And they were instructed by the best teacher outside of Jesus Christ they could ever have wished for. And yet his prayer for them is, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saint, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. What was the power? The power that raised you was the power that raised Christ, no less. See, you were dead. (laughs) You weren't just kind of in a a bad way. You weren't just, I don't know, asleep. You were dead. And so Christ declares, the beloved says, I raised thee. I raised thee. Of course, it begins that way and it continues that way. He continues to raise us up under the apple tree. It's not just a one and done thing. So he He raises us in resurrection power to the converting of our souls and He continues to revive us, doesn't He? To revive us. Do you not get dull, Christian? Is it it only me? Is it only me that gets dull? I doubt it. I doubt it. You get dull. You get cold and indifferent and careless. You do. You do. And the Lord wants to wean you away from that. He wants to pull you out of that. He wants to raise you up, revive you. Are you hearing the word, Christian? Are you? Are you so asleep and so callous that you're saying, no, I don't want to be on fire for God. I don't want to be living for God. don't, Don't be pressuring me, preacher. It's not me. It's the Lord who's in the business of reviving cold saints. He wants you to enjoy Him, and you're not. You're not. When you're cold, you're not enjoying Him, at least not to the degree that you could and you should. So he speaks to you. Ask yourself, ask, uh, healthy inquiry of the soul, am I in need of being raised up for salvation, for revival? I think we're all there. And it's his particular work. That's extraordinary. It's the greatest miracle, him raising us up. We're dead, he brings us to life. We're cold, he quickens us. Then thirdly, very quickly, his interest leads him to an expansive work. An expansive work. I don't need to say much here. We've considered this on other occasions because there, that is under the apple tree, thy mother brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bare thee. The mother. As all the reformers believe, the church functions as a mother in the world. And we've made mention of this other occasions with reference to the mother. It's the church. God, the Lord Jesus expands his work so it's not just him. Now, the primary power is through him, but he is using means. So it can be said, for example, that we are labors together with God. Labors together with God. He pulls his people in. The church functions in this role of nurturing those that are in Christ. There thy mother brought thee forth. So the church has to first be under Christ, under the apple tree. I hope we are. I hope we are. 
an awful thing for us to drift and become modern day Pharisees or some other thing that displeased the Lord. We stay under the apple tree and there we see, we see people brought forth. The church gets to birth souls, see her children regenerated, see lost people, one for Christ. The church gets to see this and they become part of this wider expansive work where Christ is not just working directly from heaven in individual lives, he is working directly from heaven over his church expanded across the globe and gathering people through that. I have a desire at some point to reflect upon there she brought thee forth that bear thee. What does it take to bear a child into the world? Us men can only hear about it by testimony. Many of you women folk, you know by experience. And I have a deep concern that we have lost or we're in danger of losing the art of travail in the church. Paul wrote about it, Galatians 4.19. I travail in birth until be Christ be formed in you. Travail. That's travail in sanctification. There's travail also in salvation. Travailing to bring souls birthed into life, to be burdened for souls. But this morning, as we close, we lean. Child of God, we lean. The table is before us. It is a place of rest, a place of refreshment, a place of revival. We lean on that body that was broken for us, on that blood that was shed for us. We lean in all that Christ is, on all that Christ has done. Will you lean today, will you? Will you lean a little more on the Lord? Will you ask Him to help you to lean more on Him? May He help us all. Let's pray. Just, just a moment we'll sing and then we'll sit at the table together. Again, it's a table for those of you that are in Christ. And the Lord Jesus invites every Christian to stay for this time and to remember what He has done and what He yet will do for you. May I ask you again, those of you here, are you really leaning on Christ? Do you know Him? Are you living a life that reflects an entire rest upon Jesus Christ? You can't, you can't lean on Him if you walk away from Him. You can't lean on Him if you make a distance between yourself and Him. May the Lord bring you near. God bless thy word. Make it a means of sanctification to every heart. And should there be those without Christ, may it be a means of saving 
maybe an instrument to provoke their conscience, to prod their hearts, to plow up the fallow ground. Save and sanctify, therefore we pray. Help us now as we continue in this wonderful privilege. Give us tender hearts. May we, by faith, gaze upon the Lamb. May we be both broken and delighted. In the same time, grieved and joyful that Christ had to die and that Christ did die. Hear us then, we pray in Jesus' name.